studying Acts 10. Acts 10 is a chapter of transition from the Samaritans to the Gentiles receiving the gospel in the book of Acts. There are two visions in Acts 10 which are connected with Peter. One is about Peter and the second one comes to Peter. In, at the end of Acts 9, there are two miracles worked by Peter. The healing of Aeneas, the lame man, and the raising of Dorcas, the woman who died, who'd been the servant of the church at Joppa. And in Acts 10, we have this vision that comes to Cornelius, and Cornelius is told, go find Simon Peter, Acts chapter 10, verse 5. And then the next day, while these men are out looking for Peter, Peter has a vision. He has a vision at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He was hungry, and all of a sudden he sees the sky opened and a great sheet coming down with animals. And then a voice says, kill these animals, cook them, eat, eat these animals. The problem is that the animals are forbidden to the Jews for food. And so Peter says in verse 14, no Lord. We have, um, we have a spiritual observation which is often made in Bible teaching and preaching in America. And it goes something like this. You can say no and you can say Lord, but you can't say no Lord. If someone is your Lord, you can't say no to them. But Peter does. I mean, what he was asked to do, what he was commanded to do, was violently opposed to every conviction that he had, every habit he had, and every religious impulse that he had. And it's, it's very interesting that to prepare him to accept the Gentiles, he was asked first to change his dietary habits. I mean, you wouldn't think that the two would be connected, but they were. There are certain old portions of the law which are passing away to be replaced by the provisions of the new covenant, which are different from the provisions of the old covenant. Peter says in verse 14, uh, I've, I've never eaten anything that's unclean and I don't intend to, to start now. Um, and then he's told in verse 15, don't call anything unclean that God has made clean. And so this is something that's upsetting to Peter as he thinks about what the vision can mean. And at that moment, Acts 10, 17, the men who are sent by Cornelius to look for him arrive at the door. He's told in verse 19, three men are looking for you, he introduces himself to them. He finds out who sent them. And then notice, notice verse 23. The men whom Cornelius sent to look for him, he invites them in to give them lodging, to spend the night with him. Now, they're Gentiles. Jews don't do that. But, you know, when you look earlier in the book of Acts, he's staying, look at Acts 10, 6. He's staying at Simon's house who is a tanner. A tanner is someone who prepares the skins of animals. That would, who, who turns cows into leather and who does other things. This, that's a very bad smelling job. It's a very dirty job. And it's impossible to remain ritually clean as an observant Jew if you do that job. So Peter had already taken one step. He was staying in the home of a tanner. Then he takes another step. He invites Gentiles in to be guests with Jews, to spend the night with Jews. You don't do that. It simply was not done in Israel. So step by step, God is opening his heart, opening his arms to the Gentiles. And the next day, they go to the place where um, Peter is. Now, when, uh, where Cornelius is. In verse 25, Cornelius meets Peter. And when Cornelius meets Peter, he bows down to him and worships him. And Peter stops him. 
don't do that. I'm just a man. Um, in English, we have two very different words which have the same letters. That's the word for God. G O D. The, this word has the same letters in reverse order. Very same letters in reverse order. Dog. Now, obviously two different things. What was Peter's problem? He treated the Gentiles like dogs. What was the Gentiles' problem? They treated men like gods. They were idolaters. As a matter of fact, if you study the religion of Greece and Rome, their gods and goddesses really weren't God in the Hebrew sense. They were just men and women who had superpowers. They were just elevated supermen and superwomen. They weren't anything at all like God. They didn't have the moral characteristics of God. They didn't have the omniscience of God. They didn't have the goodness of God. And their power was limited. They were just enhanced human beings. And it was a natural thing to do when Cornelius met Peter to bow down to him like a god, just like it was a natural thing for Peter to disdain Cornelius like a dog because he was a Gentile. Now, what's going to happen in this passage? A Gentile is going to learn how to worship God, not to treat men like gods. And a Jew is going to learn not to treat Gentiles like dogs. That's what's happening in the passage. And so, when Cornelius bows down uh, to worship him, verse 26, Peter says, stand up. I'm just a man like you. There's no reason for you to, for you to worship me. And then Cornelius, beginning in verse 30, tells him what happened. And, and so it begins to be established through the mouth of Peter in verse 34. I most certainly understand now. Look at what Peter says in verse 34. He's the lead, he's the chief disciple. He's the lead apostle, but he's being taught something that he didn't understand before. He says, I understand it now. I didn't understand it before, that God is not one to show partiality. In other words, God is not going to reject the Gentiles because they are Gentiles. God is not going to bar the Gentiles from heaven because they're not Jews. Look at verse 35. In every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Now, he's not teaching here salvation by works. He's not saying these people are going to be accepted by God because they're, they're good. But what we saw in the four verses in the Gospel of John is these people who are doing good things have already been reached by God, and they will come to the doctrine about Jesus. They will know about Jesus. They will believe the doctrine about Jesus. That's what happens in the case of Cornelius. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 10. Because look what he says in the next verse. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, pe preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. See, Christ is not just Lord of the Jews. Christ is Lord of the Gentiles. Christ is not just the Savior of the Jews. Christ is the Savior of the Gentiles. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit of power. Verse 38, we bring the witnesses, we bring the witness of what Christ did. Um, and Peter says in verse 41 that these are people who have been chosen by God beforehand. And so the gospel is clarified in verse 43. Through his name, the name of Christ, everyone who believes, Jew or Gentile, will receive the forgiveness of sins. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit fell upon the Gentile believers.
Peter was amazed. Those who came with him were amazed because it says in Acts 10, 45, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. So what does what is Peter say now? It's time to be baptized. You've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's time to be baptized with water. So you are admitted as a full member of the family. You are baptized as a Christian. The Gentiles are now officially in by the end of Acts 10. Okay, now, there are two things that happen in Acts 11. By the way, if we finish the book of Acts, we've got to do six chapters a day. We've got to do six chapters today, six chapters tomorrow, and six chapters Thursday. And so, we're going to go a little fast in Acts 11 because basically there are just two things that happen in Acts 11. The first thing that happens in Acts 11 is that Peter reports back to those Jewish leaders in Jerusalem everything that happened in Acts 10. Acts 11, 1 to Acts 11, 18. The first 18 verses is a report, a summary of what happens in Acts 10. Peter is, is explaining to the leaders in Jerusalem why he has agreed to admit Gentiles into the Christian family. That was a big deal. Because to the Jews, ethnicity and religion were the same thing. Race and religion were the same thing. The only way to become, to, to know the God of Israel was to become a Jew at least by your confession, because he was the God of the Jews. He was the God for the Jews. Now what Peter is learning is that this is not really the case. And by the way, um, God was always blessing the Gentiles. And God was always establishing righteousness among the Gentiles. If you look at the story of Abraham, the first Jew, he left his wife in the harem, in the palace of an Egyptian pharaoh in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 20, he left his wife in the harem of a pagan king called Abimelech. In both cases, the Egyptian and the pagan Abimelech showed more righteousness than the great righteous Jew Abraham. This is taught from the book of Genesis. Abraham was the first father and the great father. David was the greatest king. 2 Samuel 11, David takes the wife of a Gentile named Uriah. And that Gentile, Uriah, showed more righteousness than Israel's greatest king. It was a Gentile woman named Rahab who, who, who saved and rescued the Hebrew spies. Rahab was a Gentile. Tamar, in Genesis 38, showed more righteousness than Judah. Uh, Ruth was a Gentile. God has, uh, Cyrus, the Persian king, is called by God, my servant. He helped to, to build, to give permission to build the temple back in Jerusalem. Gentiles were being blessed all along. In Matthew 8, Jesus commends the Roman centurion and says, I've not found faith like this. No, not, above, not among all the Gentiles. So what's being established is what God meant to do all along, that salvation through Jesus Christ, himself a Jew, was going to come to all people, the Gentiles included. Peter explains how that happens. Peter explains how that that's a right thing. And in verse 18, it says, When all these leaders in Jerusalem heard the explanation of Peter, they got quiet and they glorified God. And here's the great conclusion of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. God has granted to Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Okay, so their moral consequences. You see, all kinds of things happen when a person gets saved. A person is chosen by God. That's the side of God's sovereignty. A person believes in the teaching that Christ is the Savior. That's the doctrinal side of it. 
But a person also repents from sin and believe, begins to lead, lead a righteous life. That's the moral side of it. But all those dimensions come together in true salvation. Okay, It's something that God is doing. It's something that the unbeliever is now believing that he hasn't believed before. But it's also the assumption of the new life, a pure life, a life which cares about what God wants. And when a person is saved, all those three things happen to them. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.